don't mean anything But thanks for listening yeah. Hello everybody and welcome to We Say Things episode 43 Sons Van with Cinderman I've just changed your name to Cinderman It's actually been It's been a consistent intro where I say Cinderman How do you feel about that? I really don't care <laughs> That's Is there anything that honest. I talk about that you do care about? We could have renamed this co- this podcast to something relating to you not caring about mm. anything. <laughs> You're still thinking. Good. Yeah. Thank you I so much know. for contributing uh, your level nothing, of care. Nothing. Nothing. Sorry. Nothing came to mind that interests me about you. I'll give you something you. for people watching. Okay. You can see that I have a very cuddly cat sitting on this chair. She's mm. rarely seen. Her name is Pookie Pazuki. Cinderin. Yes. She is the youngest. Named after a dessert at BJ's. That's right. Delicious dessert, I might add. Uh, well, actually, Pookie is the yep. bear from. Okay. This guy Garfield. says, I can't name my pets like I want. And he named his after dessert at an American food chain. The okay, nickname is Pazuki. The actual name is Pookie. Okay. Which apparently. Okay, is that any better? It means vagina in, in Tagalog, which my girlfriend speaks Tagalog. So. It's kind of interesting that she never told me that, but either way, because we named it together. Okay. She has been. Uh, this cat so basically. Since it means has, vagina, uh, does it mean. Is it like a wordplay on pussy then? And it's a pussy cat? Sure. We can go with that if you is like. Is that it? No, is it? I'm not pretending here. I guess uh, that, no. Is that like the I pun? said, I had zero uh, knowledge that it meant vagina in a derogatory okay. manner, but I don't care. I love my little vagina very much. Okay. Yes. So let's begin the podcast, Cinderman. Uh, I actually cannot say Cinderin anymore, apparently. That's kind of incredible. A shame, but that's how it goes sometimes. Yes. So the minor just concluded. Team mm-hmm. Aster defeated Alliance three to one in the grand finals. So they will be at the major. Did you watch any of this? Because I sure didn't. Mm, I watched a bit. I wouldn't say I watched it as much as I've watched other tournaments. Uh, Why don't you support closely. the tier two scene, Cinderin? Um I do. But okay. not this time. <laughs> <laughs> Very nah, good. I, I I don't know. I didn't I didn't watch so much this time for yeah. I was just chilling, doing other stuff. Um, but anyway, um, the bits I gathered from watching and from reading about it was that Aster was just clearly a level above. Uh, they lost one game in the playoffs, which was in the finals that they won three mm-hmm. one. Um, as far as the groups went, Alliance actually got second in their group. They got two would I think, by Gambit in that group. Yep, they did. Uh, but then they had their number in the lower bracket finals and managed to get second out of that. So Gambit got third. Uh, and apart from that, I don't feel like... I mean, that's kind of what was expected, right? These three teams were expected to be clearly the best, and they were. So it wasn't really that surprising or necessarily that interesting, except uh, how good form Aster showed. Let's see how that transfers into the major if they get there. Right. Because... Apparently, there are some complications for their players. Uh, I don't remember if it was Corona-related or Visa-related or both that they're struggling to get a Visa because of... Yeah. Uh, So apparently, that's very much in jeopardy. And I believe the major is in a week or a week and a half. So yeah, they don't have very much time to get that sorted out exactly. And that's the sad... I mean, that's what we kind of anticipated this to a degree with the minor major system, right? We talked about this. Yeah, with how uh, little time there is between the minor and the major, this was kind of inevitable. Mm-hmm. Uh, Especially since yeah, this so is in the US, which is why a lot of tournaments are not yeah. in the US. It starts in six days from right now, by the way. So Goodness. it's. Yeah. I I'm am actually going to be there. Either. Cinderella. Oh, yeah. Yes, you are. For Underlords. Yes. I, <laughs> I assume that's going to happen. I have my ticket has not been bought yet, so I'm just assuming oh. things right now. Oh, but we'll see. So you're announcing? Oh, you just broke the NDA. You're a fucked. Uh oh. Uh oh. Um, uh, we should mention for the minor, by the way, business associates went out in the group stage. That's Brax's team, the former J Storm. Uh, yep. I want to talk about their outfits real quick. Did you see them? Mm-hmm. They were wearing. Have you, have you ever seen was it? Book of Mormon? The uh, the no. play. If anybody has not seen that, it's made by the South Park uh, creators. It is god tier. I've seen it twice now. It is amazing. Um, 
And yeah, they looked exactly like missionaries. Yeah. <laughs> so if you haven't seen their outfits, they were they renamed their team business associates and they were wearing white dress shirts with black ties, all of them. And I think they were right. wearing dress pants too. And they were playing in that outfit on stage. That is the more so impressive funny. thing. I would be so That's uncomfortable. Funny. Yeah, well, no wonder they lost. That's got to be so <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, would well. you complain to if, yeah. you, let's say, because obviously this, they're not sponsored right now. They're trying mm-hmm. to go for that. Um, I love the outfits. I thought they were hilarious. But would you, oh, let's absolutely. say you were on a sponsored team and they told you that's what you had to wear. Would you complain? Because I know you do not um, like to complain unless it's, you feel very necessary. I would complain if I felt like it would hamper the performance of any of the players in the team. Yes. I think would performance, it your performance is... <clears throat> Mm, maybe it kind of depends i mean it it was kind of hard to tell from just looking at those outfits how restricted they were in something like just comfort and overall movement right um but i need as much room for my testicles as possible that's why i don't wear long pants very often i was mainly worried for black uh, for brax on that account like he has big balls major he's (laughs) he's got big balls so gargantua is what they call it (laughs) absolutely um yeah, but I mean, I, I think I think that would be the same for pretty much any team, right? If you're if you're serious about it and you feel like your outfit is making you unable to perform, I mean, compare it to any sport, right? Let's say you have a sponsor in basketball, or as you love to talk about, and part of your outfit is that it's made out of lead. You would probably complain that you can't make jump shots, right? Like or run around normally. It's a very so, extreme example, but yes, yeah, it gets the point across. I mean, mm-hmm. there's there. Are, Dress shirts might as well be made out of lead. Well, it's funny because they <laughs> you brought up the NBA, Cinderin. Uh, maybe ten years. Eh, it's probably more than ten years at this point. They instituted a rule where you have to wear like dress shirts, and you can't just come in t-shirts anymore if you're not like on the way to the game. So a lot of people oh, start out really? wearing suits just to be, when they're seen briefly going to the game. But now it's become a little bit more Classic. lax, and now you're seeing people get away with like ridiculous outfits that should never be a thing. But it but is th- it this is. is the thing that has changed in like the last 10 years, right? Is that at this point almost, the people that dress up to... It, it's like fashionable for rich people and people in the spotlight to dress down. That's like yep. the new dressed up. That's right? why like I wear pajamas everywhere I go, Cinderin. <laughs> fucking Gaben is introducing T.I. <laughs> in slippers and a t-shirt. You yes. know, like... that's. I look up to him. Boy, oh boy. Yeah. Uh, if it's like... I've got fuck you money so I can wear whatever I want. That's basically the new... See, I do all that, but without the money clothing. I feel like I'm missing a segment of that, you know, unfortunately. But it's like it's the, like the good old dress for the job you want, right? <laughs> You're dressing to, <laughs> to be, be a janitor. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to be a part of any kind of societal norms. I understand that completely. Nonconformist <laughs> at heart. Uh, moving on, <clears throat> the treasure of the fallen cinder, cinder and has come out. Bunch of Cinderin. Yes, Cinderin sets. We have Clockwork, Meepo, Elder Titan, Shadow Shaman, Oracle, Pangolier, OD, Viper, believe it or not. We'll talk about that in a moment. Beastmaster, and then the rares are a Phoenix set, and the very rare is Wraith King. Anything jump out to you, good sir? Viper is... Let's Viper jumps Viper. out to everybody. Uh, we will talk about, talk about that in a second. Uh, I like the Phoenix one. I think it's really cool. I think mm-hmm. the Wraith King one is probably my favorite Wraith King weapon, I would say, just because it's Wraith-like. Like When I looked at this set, I was thinking, it immediately inspired me of the Wraiths in the Minds of Moria and Lord of the Rings, which we talked about this uh, off the show, mm-hmm. that you were like, Wraith King in general is inspired by that, but I haven't got the same vibes as I did from this set was like really that like ghostly aura around the axe. It looks awesome. That one is really cool. It's clearly my favorite part of the set. It's the weapon. Um, outside of that, I love the cogs from Clockwork. I think that looks cool. Apart from, I, I don't know the rest of the Clockwork set. It's it's fine, but I really like the cog. It looks awesome. Okay. Um, Before we talk about the, Viper, the rest of the sets, you wanna, are, yeah, you yeah. can round it out. Other than Viper, yeah, I'm just looking at the rest of the sets. I think they're fine. There's nothing that really blows my mind. Except the awesome Wraith King and the nice Phoenix and then the Viper. All right. This one I'm very yeah. this I have a lot of highs and lows in this chest. So okay. uh I'm not a Meepo player. I think the textures of the mask specifically are extremely high quality. I was really impressed mm-hmm. with that. Uh Clockwork looks cool. Uh Shadow Shaman's pretty good. Pangolier, I was really disappointed with because he has a set that's already a conquistador in game that I partially use. 
and they made it's just like a worse version of the one that's already in the game. And he only mm-hmm. has, I think he only has one set plus the immortals. So it's really weird that they put something. Does so he similar. have another wave rapier, or is this the first one that has like this wave structure? Um, I I feel like this looks look unfamiliar. So I think I mean, that's new. again the issue that is the one. Yeah, if you want to call that a new, that's the weapon you're talking about that he's actually mm-hmm. equipped. That's the same as the immortal slot. Uh, which okay. changes it to like the bullets or whatever. Uh, we'll talk about Viper in a second. Beastmaster is really cool. I love his uh, his boar is like an. I'm just trying to remember. It's like an iguana, I believe, like a lizard creature, almost looks like a dinosaur in the game. I'm and his bird a is a is like a pterodactyl, so it doesn't look good in game. You think? I don't know. I, it's just uh, we've had this discussion many a time, and I've come more and more to your side over the years with what I think is okay to be in come the game. Come to the dark uh, side of the park. <laughs> it's. I, I looked at this, I saw these boars in game and I was like, what the hell? And then after what the hell stage, I was like, what the hell again? So yeah. the first was a, what the hell is this? And then the second is why the hell? <laughs> so do you remember uh, the boar? I'm trying to remember exactly a, what it's a, it's not a dog, but it has like a dog head almost. It's like dark brown and then a light brown base that looks totally different than a boar. That one was think, very weird at first, but you get used to it. I think the main thing that stands out for me is the um, <clears throat> is the color scheme, and that's not to say that heroes can't have color changes. We've got countless sets by now that change color schemes a bit. Mm-hmm. It's just if you have a summoned entity like that, like a boar, which is usually brown scale, and then it's suddenly green. There's a bit of glance value going on here, and we again we've sure. talked about this so much. Like, can you tell what it is? I feel like most of the time when there's a hero, there's more to go on. Like, if there's a hero, there's a silhouette. It's the overall like posture of the hero and the way it looks. Whereas these summoned units are much smaller. And when they're smaller, if the model is slightly changed and the color is completely changed, I think especially for new players, that would be confusing. Like mm-hmm. I was I wasn't like, what is this? Like I know it's a Beastmaster boar, but it's kind of like for me, it's on the edge of how far you can stretch it while it's still okay. It's like a bit borderline for me. Uh, is and it I, more or overall, less borderline than big. the pink elephant techie set? I think it's more borderline because I think the techies is extremely easy and distinct and it's okay. also extinct because nobody plays the hero. So it's fine. Wow. Like, you must be so never, happy. It never shows. Wow. Yes. Amazing. Rounding out the chest, Phoenix, I think is amazing. Egyptian style, the pyramid egg and whatnot. And the Wraith King is God tier. The only problem with Wraith King is he has so many good items. I don't like, even if I got this, I don't know what I would equip like the weapon. Yeah. But that's the weapon taking an immortal Definitely already weapon. out of the. I don't know. The whole set itself looks really sick. Okay. So Viper, Cinderin. I don't want to sully yeah. or change your opinion, taint it in any way. I want to hear it fresh from the horse's mouth. So I know your... you love it. So, okay. so I don't give me what you got. <sighs> okay, I'm gonna check it out in game real quick. I wanna see the whole thing. I wanna see it move. Okay, well please hurry so I because find I don't want to give my opinion. So I can find the proper noun for the disgust this brings me. <laughs> Uh, so that was the, the your first reaction was disgust. No, it wasn't. It's just, um, no, it it kind of in in a way it falls a bit in that beastmaster category, but not completely because this is a hero, and I don't think, especially in game, I don't think it's hard to tell that this is Viper. Okay. Um, it's for me, it's a little bit of a stretch. Once again, it's a bit more. Uh, it's like half insect, half. Viper, where the usual Viper, I don't really consider to have that insect look about it. It's mm-hmm. more of a, it's like, like a, a drake. A, yeah. Right? It's the nether drake. Exactly. But this set is, it's more insect than drake by now. Like the drake aspects are a little bit gone. You've got the wings, but now you've got these like almost, what do you call these parts that an insect Pincers. has? Is it yeah the, the the whole leg right? It's called something else. I don't remember uh, the word for this. It's like yeah the insect leg whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, what I do like though is that I feel like it's really high quality actually. I really like the pieces. I really like the you know the the detail and the way it's yeah it's just it looks really polished. So I think yep. the quality of the set is really good, but the look is not for me. That's what I'll say. So okay. uh, compared to other things that we've had put in the game recently, I think it's really high quality. Just like you pointed out, for example, with the Meepo mask, like whether you like it or not, it's very well executed in mm. terms of just quality. But yeah, uh, I'm not a fan. I'm sure you fucking love this to death. But... I fucking hate this set. <laughs> oh, wow. With a passion. I 
I don't want to talk too much shit because I know I can't remember what the artist's name is, but he's made some or they've made some really good stuff before. It's not a knock on the mm-hmm. quality. What I really hate this set. Uh, not only does it change him from a Drake, like you said, to a Beetle. Like there's no, there's nothing Drake related anymore. He's a Beetle, but which is not even remotely. You know, I don't care about the. You, you know, I like the crazy changes, but it's also in addition to it just being rainbow colored, like just like completely random colors, random parts. I don't like it, man. Very, very much on the negative side for me, which I know you're surprised with because usually I that's like the crazy surprising. stuff. Because I you do hate insects, like everything though. that. Oh, I do hate yeah, insects okay. quite there, a bit. I don't think that's related, but I will say there is a possibility that I'm biased and just unaware of it. Uh, ignorance is bliss but oh i just realized the beastmaster axes yeah. are actually kind of battle furies and oh yeah that's scheme. right I, I didn't yeah. notice until now yeah the beastmaster huh. set as a whole i really like yeah very, if you play beastmaster with the set don't buy two battle furies it's not good you don't have to role play your hero have you ever seen uh, it though can you really say based on experience that it's not good Sinner? I, I well once upon a time battle fury wind ranger was actually meta um so anything what? can win runner when was yes. this what? Back in the end of Dota 1, I think, uh, there was a time when people were actually buying it. And it wasn't, it's weird because it wasn't even that good, but it was kind of, you know, it gave damage and it gave mana and HP region. And at the time on that hero, that was really useful, but it would have been better to just buy it from wow. different components instead of building this. But yes, in top tier play, people were buying Battle Fury on Windrunner. What about Basher but- on ranged heroes when it was worse? back in the day no never really bought sniper basher cinderin think about it good stuff so that's the treasure overall i'd say it's a very good chest um disappointed with a couple so of the, the viper sets. is your least favorite oh yeah 100 percent. what's your second least favorite i mean not to um, rub salt in the wound on the people but it's clear what your favorites are so what else do you think should have been better the pango Ooh, pango yeah. probably i mean like od okay. i think looks kind of messy but it's really i'm just really disappointed that they put a pango set that just looks like a poor man's version of one that's already in the game when the hero doesn't have that many sets to begin with so mm-hmm. how about you mm, my least favorite is also the viper and my second least is probably shadow shaman i think really Huh. Shadow Shaman or OD, I would say. No, no, okay. never mind. The Beastmaster Boar. I can't. I, That's I can't not a set. Not. That's one part of the set. Okay. Yeah. The entirety, including the boar, is enough to <laughs> knock it down under the others. <laughs> wow. That is. Because the, the rest of the outfit doesn't really. Yeah, but it, it's. We just have different tastes, right? That's he kind of the cool thing about this. It's a pterodactyl, Cinderin. Okay. <sighs> yeah. Sometimes the... tastes are not subjective. <laughs> You're just really you're incorrect. <laughs> Are you sure? About this? Your opinion is incorrect. How okay. dare you? But at least we agree on the favorites. We both think Phoenix and Wraith King are the two best, I think, in this one. That's why um, they're the rares. We don't we don't always think the rares are the best. True. We are we really don't, but this time we do. So yeah, definitely true. Okay. Yeah. So I agree the most, good, good chest though. The most important the most update part. of the week, Cinderin, was the updated icons for Aether Lens and Iron Talon. I need your review. Uh, Aetherlands was actually changed twice. Mm-hmm. So now it's a more um, edgy, uh, curvy version of what we've seen before. Yeah, I feel like what Valve have tried to do with the item designs over time is make them more 3D, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's been the path that most, most of the items have taken. In the early stages, they're kind of flat, and then they give them depth. And that's what they tried in the second one. I honestly, if I had to rank these in order of how much I like them, I like the newest one the most, and I like the second iteration the least. Uh, Just because I think the first, it's also a bit blurry. Like if you look at the, it's not sharp. It was, it seems a little bit rushed, whereas the last one is very clean. Um, So Mm. yeah, I would say the the newest version looks really, really good. Now, Uh, here's the the question. We'll we'll, we'll stay on Aetherlands for now, but. You said they like to update. I, I just don't understand the point of updating these. No, like you, if you'd never change it, it's not like anybody was complaining about it. People are complaining about Morphling model, for example. Obviously, that's harder mm-hmm. to make than an icon. Way more, but, but who gives a shit about the icon at this point? I don't know. I I think some of this stuff is just the the pride of the artist. Almost, I would say. Like if you're the guy who made this and you look at it every day, whether you play or not, <laughs> and you're like, eh, you could right. probably relate to this. Like if you've made some old thing, you go back and revise it. Like if you've made a guide, you're like, oh man, I said something kind of stupid. I wish I could change it. Well, 
Mm. Here you can change it live. True, true. Uh, so you're saying it's I, a matter of pride and nothing else. I don't think they're doing this for profit. I don't think it makes the game much better. But it's well, we'll a nice see little, when the battle pass nice comes little, out. Maybe nice you unlock clean upgrade, right? I can and see I, battle sure pass unlocking old versions, Cinderin. <laughs> I would love it. Oh, is that what they're doing? That's really yes. weird. Here's some they new stuff so that you guys can pay for the old. Uh, <laughs> They've done it before, so. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, would you agree that the new icon is better overall? Do you agree with my uh, ranking? Yeah. Yeah. Or? yeah, I agree. Okay, hundred percent. I hate to agree with you, as you know. Okay, Iron Town is the next one. That was a meme mm. from back in the day that has been updated to be, I guess, the opposite of Aetherlands, more uh, pointy, if you will. It looks more kind of like a crown, but then obviously you know it's a talon, so you can see mm-hmm. that. Uh, what are your thoughts? I like it quite a bit. I actually like it a lot more than the other one. Yeah, I um, think it's better as well, but this to me is like just out of personal taste, this is a little bit in the... How do I explain this? This to me could use the extra step that Etherlands got where they can make it even more polished. But in this case, I think this version is better than the original. Mm. So it's still an upgrade, but this to me is not version final. All right. What uh, if, Cinderin? What like? Mm? I'm, I haven't really thought about this too much, but as you might imagine after I explain it to you. But you know how for TI they want to break last year's record as they always do. They're going to struggle this year more than any other cuz last year was just ridiculous. What if you could implement I was thinking from like Midas mode. Let's say mm-hmm. every icon has a little section at the top right. Okay, like a box. You can put mm-hmm. custom pictures. For who? You have to unlock it through the battle pass. You mm-hmm. get a selection of like Let's say all the personalities get a percentage of right. it, a very small percentage. And you can choose which one you want applied to the icon itself. Do you think people would care at all about that? It's so, for example, small. the Iron Talon would have my face in the top right. Yes. Yeah, I think so. But really? I think it would be... That's surprising. I don't know if I would... If I would say doing it with personalities like that is what makes the most sense. In in the end, people will pay for customization, right? If there's something mm. that allows them to do something different, stand out, sometimes people will, you know, pay to have something uglier just because it's unique, <laughs> right? I yeah. mean, look at fashion, okay? That's, that's your number <laughs> one key example of it. Some of high fashion looks really fucking weird. <laughs> I'll be honest. Yeah. And it costs a fuckload of money because it's exclusive and it's different and it makes you stand out. And the people that see it know what it is. The people you want to know what you're wearing know what you're wearing, right? See, that's that's the inherent issue, though, with that uh, mentality. Remember mm-hmm. Axe, uh, some Axe item had a blade, or not Axe item, I guess it's just a blade mail. No. The blade it, mail? Mm-hmm. It's just for Axe, yeah. yeah. Blade yeah. mail is a different icon. The problem is only you see the new version of blade mail, not other right. people. So yes. that's in most cases, kind of defeats the purpose of yeah. using it, right? But most you're saying people, if you subconsciously or customize not, this... Other people see it as well. Other people see it in your inventory. So you have yes. an Iron Talon with my face. If somebody else in the game also has an Iron Talon, it has another face or no Correct. face. Yes. Yeah. I think people would use that feature. And I think specifically if they could support people with it, I think they would do it. I mean, arguably it's kind of more game interactive than the signatures are, right? And they sell every year, the troves, where you can buy a signature from your favorite. Yeah. Because, yeah, you can apply that to an item, but it doesn't immediately show. You need to mouse over the item and look for the gem, whereas, or for the mm-hmm. signature, whereas here it's immediately visible in the inventory. Yeah. So I think that would stand out more. Now, whether you should do it with personalities, you could do it with pro players, you could do it with... Um, Maybe some sort of completely different concept than, you know, people. It could be some sort of other customization that you could do on them with similar to, say, Terrorblades Arcana, where you can choose the color. Maybe you could edit the color of your items or um, with, within reason, right? Not to run around with a full-on pink assault See, cuirass, it's right? A, but, it is a fine line because of the whole... We talk about how the new player experience is the biggest deal mm-hmm. for us. Yeah. That does contribute to making the game... Yeah. Harder. I mean, it's not. I wouldn't say it's inherently it was just harder an idea. to I'm not understand. It's good. But I'm not saying it's good. Yeah, it was but just the top kind, of my head. My point is know. that kind of customization is something people will pay for and will want because there's countless evidence of that in other games, especially in like MMOs, right, where you can 
edit the outfit of your character, people will pay to change the color of their items or to, you know, change the out the look of the items without changing the attributes at all. It's the same relative strength, but just looks different. That mm-hmm. happens all the time in all sorts of games. Like yep. that's kind of cosmetics in a nutshell, right? Like any cosmetic is that's what it is. Yeah, it's all about finding that you can buy that new viper set and the people you want to know what is they know what you are (sighs) you know and the rest think you're a new hero the thing i don't get is if they're going to implement that set why not just change his ult to be a literal rainbow like just go (laughs) all out why go halfway just well we have that with enchantress impetus right that's true (laughs) i actually forgot about that there is a literal literal rainbow in the game uh okay Moving on, Cinderman. Uh, rank, yep. roll, update. I guess I'll just read yes. what the blog post says and then sure, we'll discuss ahead. it. Today's update features a change to the rank system that replaces the core slash support separation with a single rank that uses handicaps for each of the five ranked roles, representing your relative strength playing each position. This change will help the matchmaker better account for a player's different performance levels between various roles. Winning or losing games will modify your single rank. It's kind of gone back and forth a lot throughout... Uh, the past few months when queuing your best role the matchmaker will consider your full mmr queuing for your weaker roles however will result in the matchmaker placing you into a match at a lower mmr when you match into a game it will display the adjusted badge levels that were used to match each level regardless of which role you queue and queue for and play the results of the match will affect your actual mmr value your initial levels for each role are calculated based on the previous core slash support MMR values and analysis of your past 100 games. You can track the current role adjustments in the role queue menu. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. First of all, I believe in the very high ranges, it doesn't matter because we still don't have ranked roles above 7.5k. So yeah. I haven't noticed a difference. Um, but as far as this goes further down the list, I think... It's a good change. It's something people have been talking about that if you queue, some people are much better at one thing than another, and it's just hard if you queue for if you don't get your role or if you know if if something weird happens in the game or whatever, or you're forced to play a different role because you just need to queue and find a game, and then you get put on a role you're way worse at than your best role. Then mm-hmm. this, uh, you know, this kind of accounts for it in a, in a pretty elegant way. The the downside for me is if the sample size is a hundred games, I just don't know if that sample is big enough. If I can be honest, like if it says it can't, it it analyzes your past hundred games. What if you've played carry in one game? What's your carry MMR now? Let's say you've played soft support ninety nine games and you've played hard carry one game. I mean that's not what, too far from what I'm at with core exactly. versus support. Like just I don't think that is a very uncommon situation, and the same the other way around because people were specialists before, right? So some people have almost all their games on one role and almost no games well, on the others. Does it specify that it's not then, the last hundred games for each specific role? It doesn't is say that, that on the wording. That's what I'm wondering. But mm. what if, yeah, so then the next question is, well, what if you don't have 100 games on right. your roles? Like, what does, it, what does it gather this information from? If you've only ever played, to put it on edge, let's say you're a, pro, a player that has played 500 ranked games, and you've played 10 games of carry out of those mm. 500, how accurately can it place your carry MMR? Will you just stomp in the start and make imbalanced games because it thinks your carry MMR is 1,000, whereas your other rank MMRs are like 4K mm. or, you know, who knows? But uh, I haven't heard massive complaints after this was implemented about imbalanced games, so I'm guessing the implementation is pretty, pretty well done to begin with. I'm sure they are optimizing it and that it's not flawless, but compared to a lot of other stuff that Valve have implemented with matchmaking, this was met with very much optimism overall, at least by the community on Reddit. Uh, people were yeah. saying this is really good, and nobody was really like, man, this is shit, why are they doing this? Because It's because they made a cool-looking graph. If it's graph. implemented... I mean, <laughs> first of all, it's, it's, it's nice-looking, right? But if it's yes. implemented well, it's kind of hard to find the downside. I think that's why people aren't complaining. There's like no inherently bad thing about this design. There's an inherently bad thing about it if it's implemented poorly, because then you can abuse the fuck out of it. But if people aren't experiencing that or can't prove it, then it's just good, right? It's... I mean, for me, it's hard to truly judge until I've really played a lot of games under it. Yeah. But for now, don't really notice much difference, honestly. So yep. we'll just have to wait and see. And that's something we can kind of bring up from time to time, depending on uh, if there are any actual noticeable changes, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. So another thing they came out with, this was interesting. So I'm going to read this one as well. Mm-hmm. It's not as long, but this was this really, really interesting. interesting. 
So they updated the game, and in the update, they said, in this update, we're introducing a new system for gathering data on the type of changes that are harder to evaluate or predict without very large number of games, such as gold bounty formula changes. We expect the number of times that we actually do this during the year to be very low. However, when we do it, it'll be during the weekdays only at the lowest point of user activity between 4 and 6 p.m. Seattle time. In addition, we are adding a console command that can be used by players to disable it. Any gameplay changes will only be active in matchmaking games where no players have the, the command set. The changes will never be active in lobby and league games. We recognize that in some cases, players will back solve what changes were done. However, we won't announce changes ourselves in part because we don't want players to overcompensate with knowledge of them because generally we prefer not to reveal potential upcoming changes. Although the type of changes we are thinking about like goal distribution take much more than a game or two to show their full impact, we will still be able to get meaningful data and analysis on the direction and the scale of changes. So I'm sure they've done this. I'm not going to lie. I don't know if you disagree with me. So let's actually discuss what this is, right? So mm -hmm. the way that yeah. I interpret it is they're going to, without your knowledge, of course, you can disable mm -hmm. this ahead of time, but without your knowledge, the game mechanics in terms of like the gold income or the even the tick rate of the gold will slightly change, if not maybe in some games, who knows, drastically change just to get those data samples and see how they affect so they can actually balance future updates. So they won't have like, right. like we won't have, you know, a couple of years ago, we had these crazy rubber band effects that were just absolutely ridiculous and they get balanced mm -hmm. over the course of the weeks. So yeah. my question is, do you think they've done this before and just no. haven't said anything? I actually don't think they have. Okay, why? I think why what think they have that? done in the what they have done in the past is if they've wanted to do a new economy thing, for example, like this with the the bounty or gold bounty or whatever it is, I think they've tested it massively internally, but the sample size just isn't big enough. Like this rubber band, let's say all the beta testers and everybody in close client or whatever uh, have played a hundred games of a patch before it launches. That's still a sample size that is smaller than they will get through two hours of this, right? Mm -hmm. The amount of raw data they can get in such a short amount of time is extremely valuable. So I don't think they've done this before. And I think they've come to a point where they feel like the game is at a level of complexity, especially now that they've also added neutral items and stuff, that predicting game impact is something that's been harder and harder. And now it's probably at a point where they feel like, man, this is like, we need data. And possibly because of the especially long-term, right? They might be implementing this to test it for the next season because once leagues start running, there's like no downtime almost, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be tournaments all the time. So if you're patching, you need to have higher accuracy that your patches are actually good or at least that they're meaningful. Uh, whether, you know, whether it's better than a previous patch in every way or that's also super subjective, right? They just want to avoid that something is completely out of line. Such as, like right. you said, the rubber band mechanic, right? In the past, has been absurd, where losing the early game was almost an advantage because if you got one kill minute 15 while being 5K oh, behind, again, you almost equalized the game. Right? That was I absurd. think people don't seem to so. realize from a developer standpoint, you can come out with these big changes, and it's really hard to test them on a grand scale. Mm -hmm. when You, like, you have a beta team, like you're talking about, but there's only so much data you can get from those, right? So, And all of the data they get they will not have representation of the lowest rank of players and not mm -hmm. of the highest rank of players because the majority of these beta testers have played for like thousands of hours, but they're not pros and they're also not total beginners. So there's going to be like Garbage. this massive, yes. there's this massive outlier group that isn't represented. All of the well, best here's and all my the other worst players are not there. So. so there's two points. So the first point is, do you think, so again, if one person in your game has this command mm -hmm. activated, it will not, uh, Correct. be using any crazy effects that they may add yeah. at your level do you think mm -hmm. that will ever happen i'm, I'm guessing most pros will in, like will disable this i personally right don't have it set um but if i was playing actively professionally right now i might set it just because then my practice is more reliable whether it's a pub game uh or it obviously isn't in private lobbies right but even if you're playing a pub game you want to feel like you're in touch with the game and if something like that changes it can throw you off you'll make wrong conclusions about what mm. you should have done in a real game etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, i think if you are uh, a pro player you should probably set this convar and that's fine like um, there are plenty of very high rated players that are not pros that will still have this off and there will be a decent sample uh, regardless the majority of the data that valve will get from this will not be from europe uh 
which is just you know from my perspective it's 6 p.m seattle time which is well see that's the other like thing that's so interesting so later in the the thing like i like i read it says however we won't announce changes ourselves in part because we don't want players to overcompensate with knowledge i mean obviously that's important mm-hmm. for any kind of experiment but then they say yeah. We'll be doing it between 4 and 6 p.m. generally. <laughs> so I feel like maybe there will be some overcompensation. Like people will have uh, um, the placebo effect, if nothing else. Well, people, I think, yeah, it's possible that there's placebo. But on the other hand, I think the vast majority of people won't really be thinking about it. They make the conscious choice of, do I want to have this on or off? Right. And if I have it on so that I can be put in these games, you probably don't even think about what time of day you're playing. And if you played in a weird game where the gold is like 20% different from killing heroes or whatever, you might not even notice. Honestly, I think you might not notice. No, I agree. Um, for the most part, you won't know. Uh, but I think it's important that they don't announce ahead of time that they're doing it because, like you said, it really impacts the the research that they're doing. Because if you tell players, hey, guys, if you're curing during these two hours, hero kills are worth way less, well, it's obviously going to impact the way people play. And then the experiment won't be useful because everybody's just farming creeps. Because they're like, oh, heroes don't give gold. So we're just Mm. not going to kill them. I have a theory. There you go. Mm -hmm. I have a theory. It's actually I don't actually think this is what they did, but this would be kind of next level smart. They announced that they're only generally doing it between that, those times because they know most pro players that they want to get data from are in Europe that will disable mm-hmm. the option, but maybe they don't feel like they need to disable because they're never doing it during the times that they play. Maybe they're exclusively getting data from EU and not NA, Cinderin. It's a trick, all right? That's uh, the next level play. But here's my actual question. I mean, it is the best region to get data from because we're yes. we the best. We the best. But, um, <laughs> So let's say this is a, a success from a data mm-hmm. retrieval perspective. Do you right. think, let's go down a year in the future. Do you think, it maybe even shorter uh, time frame than that, do you think that they'll change, they'll try this for other changes that are maybe a little bit more drastic, like the damage amounts from items or you know things of that nature that you would not expect from just a purely data standpoint? Because this is gold, yeah, this is very hard so. to, you know, it's hard to see the difference in a game most likely if you change like the way that mm. an item i mean i guess if it's like two damage difference you're not going to tell but yeah the thing is with items i think it's more predictable honestly i think systems like bounty are way more complex than mm. the damage versus armor armor formula for example or hit points versus strength formula or whatever it is like those those formulae are relatively straightforward. But the bounty where it's like relative gold difference within your team to the enemy team and what ranking you are on the board and what your kill streak is and all this stuff makes it like it, the bounty formula basically uses so many dynamic things that are happening in the game compared to items that use my damage, your armor. Like that's it. There's nothing else going on, right? So mm-hmm. you can quickly... I don't think it's necessary for that. That's my point here. I think the complex systems are where this is super useful because that's where it's really difficult to predict uh, what is going to happen. So they only I think mentioned... what they could try this on would be neutral items, for example, because that to me is a way more complex system. It like but items, items. Need to drop. Items need to drop. They need to be equipped by specific heroes at specific times in the game. Uh, they vary in which team acquires them. Like maybe one item is better for Radiant than Dire because of map mm-hmm. layout or whatever. You know, these kind of things I think are, there's okay. a bit more variance and complexity mm-hmm. to that than the purchased items. And also history, right? The items, most of the items anyway, have been in the game really long. So they have already been tweaked. And So you're saying as, for some as opposed to the, just the changing of the actual items themselves, it's more about... The percentage of the drop, system. for example, or do you yes. think that they would change the amount of drops experimentally? Maybe something because like, that one well, would be they, very obvious in game. Yes, happened, that would right? be visible, right? But they could change the percentage. People would not notice if the chance of an item dropping was twelve yeah. percent instead of nine. So they would just be like, thinking, "Oh, I was lucky," you know. So you're talking about how uh, yeah. complicated the gold like bounties are, for example, but outposts, mm-hmm. anything XP related. They, I would assume um, that that's part of this, actually. They only yeah, mentioned so, gold, but they said gold distribution, among other things, they implied. 
So I think so XP just to might clarify, be one of the well. gold bounty formula is not bounty runes. Right. That's not what is meant by this. This is the bounty of killing a hero, for example. Well, it could be related about, to all of it, though. It the way I interpret it, it could be anything to related to gold, essentially. Right. Yeah. It's it's just the formula for what how you get gold for something in the game. Experience is the same thing. Like the current formula for experience is actually archaic. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but. Uh, I'll give you a, a funny thought experiment here. Let's say you're playing Centaur offline, which is very likely for you. That's uh, not at all likely. Was, actually. was very likely. <clears throat> you were playing yeah. against Undying, and you hate your life, and he kills you three times in a row. You're level one. He is level three. Mm-hmm. He has a killing spree. And now he runs to suicide to a tower, and you're nearby. <laughs> you okay. get two full levels because he has a killing spree. Mm-hmm. Because a hero that has a killing spree gives 400 extra experience to kill, regardless of the time of the game. So you can have a killing spree minute two, and getting killed at that tower means you just full on made a comeback in the lane because he suicided to the tower. If he was 2 0 instead of 3 0, you wouldn't even get level two. Like, that's, that's how it crazy, used to right? be. That's how it is. That's how it is now. Because I was going to say, it feels it, like the rubber band effect is pretty strong. It's like, kinda, it feels like the laning stage... Okay, I know this is not true for pro level, but maybe it is mm-hmm. to a degree. The way that... Like, the laning stage almost doesn't even matter for my skill level. Like, ancient, divine. You can get shit mm-hmm. on. If you get, like, one kill, you're back. You're back eventually. Like, Especially, it just feels that's that way all the time. A big part of the reason is that people that do really well in the game will make a crucial mistake, and they don't realize how much it matters to they lose get a killing cocky. streak or a dominating yeah. streak. Yeah. Uh, but at high levels of execution, those kills are extremely impactful. And you could even tailor your strategy to this guy has a mega kill streak. If we kill this guy, it's actually more impactful than killing mm-hmm. two other heroes in the game right now. It will right. give us more to kill this one guy. So uh, I think that is possibly something they're looking at with this change. I think that's something that has been brought to their attention that, hey, this experience formula is kind of outdated. It's kind of a thing of the past back I don't know when this was changed the last time, but it feels it honestly feels like a leftover from Dota 1, not even exaggerating. Back when the game was way more casual and it was more about, oh, hey, man, we killed this big guy in the enemy team. We got a big reward. Because um, if you think about it, most of the other changes that they've made to systems like these, they're dynamic, right? It's like the gold you get is a relative formula, but the experience you get for ending kill streaks is an absolute number. And that is kind of weird, right? That that one is not. It's funny that you dynamic, right? Not to change the subject, but it's funny that you said more casual back in the day. When I think of it as more hardcore, not a, for that um, thing specifically. More so, get like getting into Dota was actually harder back then. Joining lobbies I was guess, much harder back then. How do right I now you have this? tons of comeback mechanics. You have outposts, which makes the game like Heroes of the Storm. Like all, it's like a battler. Just constant battles. So I, I don't mean how difficult the game is as such. No, no, no. I, I, to get I'm not into. talking about your... Yeah, I, I think maybe you know what I mean when I say casual I in the wording. It's like the level of the average player and the understanding of the game of the average player was extremely much lower. If you're a beginner now, the game might be easier to get into in many ways, but the average player is way more knowledgeable and way better at the game. Like hands if you down. had a... No let's say you could choose it. one skill group. What's mm. the lowest skill group currently you think would take out ti1 navi if you just give me an I mean, mmr these, these an average ex- mmr these thought experiments are always weird because the game was also different right but if we I, imagine yes yeah you take the skill level you a team of 5k's i think five so you think 4k's would lose probably yes <clears throat> i think okay. so something i mean it's I mean, okay. what kind of a guess is this but you're saying yeah, i could just, win ti TI1. You could be part of a team that wins TI1. With You've the current seen me play, so. Cinderin. Yeah. Uh, okay. You, you're right. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe they 6K. didn't have Centaur in the game back then. There's no Pangolier. <laughs> here. Who the fuck? I, Pudge? I have a 45% win rate with All right. Pudge. Your Chen would not win TI. <laughs> yeah, that was that was bad. That's, uh, that was real bad. That's for sure. My Clinks wouldn't either, though. So we're cool. <laughs> well, Clinks wasn't in TI1. No. But if it were, I would not win on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't go watch that uh, one. Take that, take that episode off, guys. Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, Cloud9 yeah. announced uh, some changes to the roster. Uh, we can just talk about their entire roster as a whole. So, again, Snake King and Eternal Envy we were talking about last week. Um, yep. No longer on the pandas. I can't, fighting pandas, I guess they were called. Yep. So, they're on Cloud9 now. Again, Eternal Envy, position one. 
Ace, position two. Snake King is the three. Misery is the four. And Pilai Dai is the five. So this is very similar to the old Cloud9 roster that was getting second place after second place. <laughs> Will they be successful this time around? Cloud9 back into dotes. It's honestly, I think the potential is there. Like their players are very good. They're proven. Um in their respective roles. I think that everybody in this team is playing their best role, probably. Um, Ace is debatable if he's better on carry than he or better on carry than mid, which he's playing right <clears throat> in this team. Uh, if we assume position two will be playing mid in the meta that they're playing, which is probably the case. Uh, but I think Envy needs to play carry. Like he belongs there. He should play this role. It's clearly what he's better, best at. He's tried some other things. It was not even close in overall game impact. This is where he belongs. Snaking is clearly an off laner. Misery is clearly a four and Pilot Eyes a five. Misery has played five with some success, um, but I think four is his, probably his current best role, at least. Uh, his best result ever was, however, on offlane. He won a major with Team Secret when he played offlane. Well, you could um, say his best was second place yeah. at TI. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's probably a bigger... It's not a victory, but it's a bigger <laughs> result. That is true. What did he play at that TI? He played four, right? He played four. Uh, actually, I, so. I don't know what he played. He was captain, obviously, but... It was like a 5-4 hybrid with Soxa, because Soxa always yeah. ended up with more farm, it felt like. Cause, and his mechanical skills like, higher, I think. They're flexible in how they play. He was playing traditionally four heroes, I think, a lot of the time. Whether he I played 5 it, or 4, he was I think it was more types. dependent on which hero he was playing with yeah. Soxa. I think Soxa played maybe 5 a little bit more often. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly. He played 5 heroes more than Misery, but often got 4 farm. Whereas Misery played 4 heroes and got 5 farm. So yeah, they had this like weird right. four and a half dynamic kind of going, which worked for them. So that was great. Do you know yeah. who the anyway, captain of this team is, by the way? Mm, I, I think it's Misery. It it has to be Misery, I think. Pilai Dai is, I don't know if he's a captain kind of role in a team, uh, Very but I think Misery yeah. Misery is probably, I would say, the captain. But there's there's uh, voices in this team. Both Snaking and Envy are very vocal players. Ace and yes. Pilai Dai, in my experience, are probably a little bit on the softer side, but Pilai Dai is definitely... He might be like deceptively communicative because if you're watching and just in touch with the pro scene for the last years and you've seen Pilot I play, like when it comes to interviews and stuff, he doesn't necessarily have that much presence in interviews and he doesn't, uh, he, he's very well spoken. He just doesn't do it very much. Uh, but, mm. you know, that isn't necessarily a representative of how he works in a team. So he might be shot calling a lot for all I know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how they do. I think the players are really good. My expectations for this team are big question mark. I honestly just don't really have Let's a clue. Let's make some predictions, okay? Because um, we talked but, about before, yeah. and I tout this as a know-it-all personality, mm -hmm. that I have a good grasp on what rosters can mesh well, personality-wise. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what, what, are your, what are your... Set some expectations. I know you say it's up in the air, but make a prediction. Mm -hmm. Um... I think this team will qualify for tournaments because they're an NA. And that isn't meant as a joke. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's not meant as a joke. Uh, but I think this roster would not be in my scope for one that would qualify regularly for majors or even minors in Europe. Mm -hmm. But in the NA region, I think they fit nicely as a contender for second best team, honestly, right now. Behind EG, it is possible that they could take the second slot. And if not, they would probably take the third slot. As the region looks right now, there might be more stuff coming up. Uh, who knows? Like it's very clear right now that EU is a minefield, and NA is more like a a gold mine right now, if you will, or um, hmm. you have a much better chance. So, uh, hard to say really. But I mean, it is kind of telling as well, right? Three of the players in this roster are Scandinavian, and they're going to play in an NA team. Um, which that's true. By the rules, but that's for the league thing. system. For the league system, you need to have the majority of players reside in the region. But currently, it's like this gray zone where the organization can reside in the region. Correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong. I so honestly, technically, they've gone for back this and DPC, forth so many times. I don't freaking yeah. I, I feel like it's not completely black and white, but I think for this DPC, this roster is eligible to play in NA even without the three Scandinavian players living in NA. Any of them. I don't know if any of them does. It's possible Pilot I lives there. I, I feel like he's been living different places in the last couple of years, so it's possible he lives there. Um, but anyway, yeah. I, I think on paper, this team is definitely not EG tier. Uh, they need to convince me otherwise. But below that, they are a top contender. I think, I think okay, so my perspective so. from a talent standpoint, quite good. 
think they can mm-hmm. definitely qualify for a lot of tournaments. Uh, this, just based on my first reaction, what is it, March? This roster, I was going to say, has like a six-month lifespan, which basically aligns with okay. TI, so that's not really saying that much. Um, obviously, they don't have a great showing at TI. There will be major changes, if not a complete disband. Biggest question mark, as always, is Eternal Envy. He's... I mean, the, the memes about the, the 50-50 thing, are it's actually... is. It's so accurate. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And it's not just I mean, from every, a playing standpoint. Every good joke has like some root in reality, right? That's what and you That one say. is almost so. exclusively reality. So um, that's not even a joke. <laughs> I think from, like, I don't have firsthand experience with lo- uh, some of these players, like Ace uh, and Snake King. I don't know that much about, even though he's been in the NA scene a lot. Pilot Die, solid as a rock. That's a guy that you can count on, I think, as position five. Very, very good. I think biggest question marks. In terms of personality or envy and misery together, uh, misery can be a bit of a hothead. They've played together before, so they have. at least the experience is there. They played on the major winning team. Yes, but that's with Puppy as right. your captain. You have an authoritative mm-hmm. figure, which I think envy Pai was needs. also in that team, right? It was yeah. all three of them. Highlight I was the four, team. misery the three, Weha the two, I believe. Uh, Pai was the, the five, right? Puppy was four in that team. Oh, true. I think. Either way. So I think those personalities have a potential to clash a bit, but if they put their baggage aside, then they can definitely be successful. Uh, I don't know. This is this is a weird one because, like you said, there's so many variables with Envy. I never know with this guy. Like he's been hot and cold. I think historically speaking, the last in terms of recent bias, the last two years, it's been very very cold for him. He's still, from a business standpoint, from an organizational standpoint, I think he's still a a hot player to have. He draws viewership. He makes people talk. He, you know, he's the kind of person that makes people engaged in your team for good or bad. They're going to watch your true. games to see him fail, to see him succeed, to see the memes. Like whatever the reason is, he is the kind of player so that draws people to watch the game. From a marketing standpoint, so. he's a good player. From a winning yeah. standpoint, maybe not so much. At least not recently. from a winning standpoint, not lately. But yeah. that said, though, I think he actually played uh, very well in the uh, Bukoville Minor. I actually think he played very, very well in that tournament. So definitely stepped up his game to some older form. Um, and if, he, so, if he's on that trajectory, he could be top tier again. I think he has yeah. it in him. I, I it's think about all these taming players that, are it's, very good. It's about taming that beast, the really. Beast. Uh, so that's where I, I have some issues with this roster. Because <clears throat> let's say Misery's the captain. Mm-hmm. First of all, I think Envy as a captain just doesn't work, plain and simple. I don't think it, I think it's as black and white as it can be. <clears throat> His okay. complete captain will not work. Now, position one, it is important in the late game for that guy to be able to call shots. So I'm guessing he will still do that. And the question is, will that clash with the captain, which we assume is misery? That's the biggest question mark for me. If they can't get mm-hmm. past that hurdle, this is a very good roster. So we'll have to see. Yeah. Okay. Moving on, ESL Academy. We talked about this uh, a few months ago. Basically, yep. it's kind of like the uh, tier two scene, and you, it culminates in like a final where people get drafted. I don't know if they're still actually doing all that, but they will have coaches now officially. Loda, yep. PyCat, Demon, and Dubu will be the coaches in ESL One LA. They'll be drafting their teams. Uh, as I'm reading that now, so I will confirm what I just said. They will be doing that. What do you think about this? Do you still like the concept? We talked about the idea think, being kind of cool, yeah. but not sure if it would be successful. Right. I mean, I'm still in the same spot as I was back then. Like, I want to see it happen. I want to see the reception. But I'm always a big fan of, like, creative new ways of engaging viewers and making unique content, right? Because, mm. let's face it, the majority of Dota content is very much the same. We, as a scene, are not very good at making non-game content. A lot of the top teams are not very media-savvy. They don't, maybe they are, they just don't want to do media. Like most of the top teams just compare, if you compare it to other games, there's just way less content with the players, like personal content or entertainment content or educational content. Uh, In other games, they do a way better job. And it's a bit of a shame, but I think in a way it makes a lot of sense in Dota because the vast majority of money is in wins, not in salary or regular uh, you know, seasonal stuff. Whereas in other games like CSGO or Call of Duty, uh, a big chunk of your money is your salary. But if you're at that tier one level in Dota, the only thing that really matters is do you get championships? Do you get top fours? That's where the money is. So uh, the perspective is different, which is a bit of a shame. 
But this kind of thing, you know, it's cool because we get to see them in a different way. You get to see these people coaching some random players that they might not even know or never have played with before. Uh, I think the majority of the success of this is not going to come from the format, but from the presentation. Like if they do a good job at making it engaging for viewers to see like good camera shots with the coaches. Make it a reality of... show almost. That would be cool <laughs> to get some of that. I mean, I'm not even kidding. There's a little bit yeah, of a I mean, taste of that. Almost something, you know? almost something to that extent where it's a lot more about the um, what happens outside of the game rather than what happens in the game. Like, How do they motivate their players? How do they structure strategy? What goes into their thoughts of how they draft players? Uh, how do you prepare your team? How do you set up for drafting? For a team of five players you don't even know like these kind of things i think people will find very interesting to see um so i hope that they do a good job at presenting that and that will make it interesting so uh, i think the games themselves will likely be less interesting than regular pro dota right because the skill mm-hmm. level will be lower so it's about the other stuff that well, makes it that fun. could make it more fun in some respects because they may- maybe you'll have people that just outshine everyone else right to an extent, yeah. It's possible. Extent. So after coaching them through the month of April, one of the teams will be crowned the champions at ESL Birmingham. So that's yep. kind of what's set up right now. So my question, so from a drafting perspective, I find this very interesting because I love drafts. They're just so much mm-hmm. fun. Obviously, it doesn't really, like the last time I can think of a major draft of the tier one scene is back in the CGS days where we don't need to talk right. about the tournament as a whole. But it makes it more complicated from like the structure of all tournaments an entire pro scene it's just very complicated to actually make that work as cool as drafting people for like an actual dpc thing would be it's just not really realistic so no. the tier 2 scene you'll see some of that and like you said presentation is going to be very important if you had to choose one coach Cinderin, who do you think would be the most helpful as a tier 2 player to get to the next level so again it's loda pycat mm. demon dubu Huh. I think that's really difficult to answer because... Uh, you're such a cop-out. No, so listen, I, I know I often give vague answers, but in this I can give like some more like hard answers because the type of coaching that people need is really different. Some people are all about the motivation, like uh, getting hyped up, building confidence in yourself, and others is more about like guidance with what you should be focusing on in your work ethic or what you should be focusing focusing on in your gameplay. And I think these players have very different strengths in that aspect. Um, I don't know them well enough personally to say it for certain, but you know, somebody like Loda, I think might not necessarily be the biggest motivator, uh, but I think he would be a very good uh, like analytical guy or a guy to give you gameplay advice, for example, whereas a demon with the stuff we've seen from him could easily be a little bit more on the hype side. Um, and Dubu is, <laughs> Dubu, I think is, um, how to say he would be a really good life coach. Cause I think he's very, you know, he's like, he's lively, he's funny. He lightens the mood of teams, uh, which is also should definitely not be underplayed how much it matters to be in a good mental space when you're playing. That's not to say the other guys can't do it, but my read on Dubu is just like, he's just a fucking funny guy. <clears throat> right. Mm. Uh, so really depends what kind of player you are and what you're looking for if you're looking to have a good time and build confidence in yourself or if you're like really confident in yourself and you need to take the next step those two trajectories are very different in what is best for you okay well um, unlike you i'm gonna pick so, someone so okay. i'm gonna go through the list here dubu i don't really know about that much about other than the stream and whatnot so I'm just Cop gonna take answer. him out of consideration that I'm, okay, that's I'm eliminating everybody. Demon, not a great <laughs> track record. Talked about that before. Not on my list. PyCat and Loda. This one's harder because PyCat coached DC. I got to work mm-hmm. with him a little bit. I think he's very eloquent. He's very good at talking with people. He's a smart guy. I think his track record as a player, not terrific. So that And even his track record as coach other than the TI, not terrific. And then Loda. Haven't worked with him specifically. Um, probably not as eloquent as somebody like PyCat, but at the end of the day, I think the most important thing is your resume. TI winner, like, let's say you're a tier two player, even if you have like a hot head on your team, mm-hmm. I don't think you can really uh, talk back or question somebody like Loda who's actually been there and done that, unlike everybody else on this list. So I think, like, you're right, every single coach has something to bring to the table for each, you know, depending on what personalities need on the team. I think mm-hmm. from an overarching standpoint, you would Loda will probably fit the most for most people because purely on his resume alone. Right. So that's who I would And I mean, pick. he's also actively 
taking on like at least a semi coach role for Alliance, right? At True. least he was with the old Alliance before they became Liquid. I don't know how he works with the current team, uh, but he's definitely in touch with that side of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as if you want to look at something that I'm sure people would care about, especially these players if they're trying to get further, if you're looking at who is like the hottest in the game right now, it's definitely not Loda. He's not playing competitively. He's not playing at a very high level uh, compared to, I think, in order right now with MMRs, if you want to do something that banal, I think Dubu has the highest MMR out of these coaches. Second highest might be Pycat, then Demon, then Loda, way further down. That's mm-hmm. not to say he's a bad player, but he's not you know, actively trying to be in a, a huge... Or a great gaming shape. So I his reads he on the a game. Shit ton of games, though. At least not just Alliance games. Absolutely, right? but there is still there's an element, there's a level that isn't there when you're not yourself really in sync with the game. Like some reads, some like it's hard to explain in any other way than like I like to talk about flow sometimes. Just like when you're playing the game and stuff is just happening the way you're imagining it. It's like you're just a part of the game and you know how strong you are. You know what the timing is. You know what's coming up next. You can watch a lot of Dota. You can read a lot of books. It's not the same as having your fingers in the game, right? Like, read 10 books about building a house. You'll probably learn more about building a house the first time you actually try it. And that's that's kind of the thing here, where I think that will be Loda's biggest weakness compared to the others. It's just his flat out, how in touch with the finesse are you right now compared yeah. to the other players? And yeah, depending on the level, it can matter less or more. Um, but yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't, don't think disagree there, with the choice. I, think I don't Loda think there's would be a, a choice, so. I don't think there's a correct answer because I guess that's right. what I value most in a coach from my perspective. So it, again, mm-hmm. comes down to each individual. Yeah. I think all of them will do well. All right, let's talk about the coronavirus real quick, Cinderin. <laughs> so <laughs> from one answer to the next, <laughs> <laughs> from Loda uh, to coronavirus. In <laughs> respects to ESL one <laughs> LA, a lot of question marks on whether it will happen or not because some things are being canceled. Mostly things in Europe at this point. There's a couple things yeah. like conventions in Seattle, but generally speaking, right now in the U.S., there's a few cases in like each respective state, but wouldn't call it like anything crazy yet. Uh, so ESL posted something yesterday. The Los Angeles County officials declared a health of emergency in a press conference. The number of coronavirus cases has a, is totaled seven at the moment. All of them connected to risk regions outside the U.S. and not considered community outbreak risks at this time. There's a continued conversation between the health authorities, the venue operator, and us. This is from ESL's perspective, of course. The current Mm -hmm. recommendation by health department is that all major sport events remain open to the public unless there's a wider community outbreak. So right now it is happening. But of course, they mentioned later that it is dynamic. So things can change. Uh, What what do you think is going to happen? This is like such a such a weird thing, right? That you don't see this very often. I, I, I think this will be played with an audience. I don't think there's going to be that drastic changes in the U.S. within the next 10 days, but I am not an expert on coronavirus. I don't know how fast it travels, how much is happening right now compared to two weeks ago. Uh, you know, with anything that spreads from a small area to a bigger one, uh, the start is slow and then it can explode really quickly. It's like exponential <laughs> growth, right? When more areas get affected, it very quickly spreads. So it's not even down to the U.S. specifically. It's also a little bit about, honestly, sheer luck. Like who comes into the country without it being discovered from which country and uh, carries the symptoms and how many people they come in touch with. You know, Some people travel into the country and maybe don't interact with many people. Others go out every night into nightclubs with hundreds of people and then you know the spread is way more rampant it's it's just chance to a large extent that really is what diseases are right it's a bit about luck uh, and of course it's going to be more of a risk in bigger regulation. cities la being yeah. i believe the biggest maybe new york is i'm not sure one of the two it's big for sure so yeah this is going to be a thing to keep track of as the week progresses but I want to bring up the NBA as another thing because I figured if the NBA's continue to play games, yeah. then probably this will That's continue. A totally but they did have scale. they did have a an announcement that they are talking like teams have been contacted saying it's possible if it gets bad enough that the mm-hmm. teams will still travel and play their games, but there will be no audience, which would be crazy. I've never seen anything like that for the NBA. That would be uh, so weird. I guess That'd probably be like the, the people that bought finals. their. <laughs> It'll be in the gym with the Han final. <laughs> Except the lighting might be a tad better. Uh, There's going to be better production, but that's it. 
But uh, yeah, so I think it's probably going to be fine, but you never know. I mean, the other thing to consider, and it mentioned it here, most of the cases are because of, it's not like it's being homegrown or anything like that. Everything's from the outside. Mm-hmm. When you think of esports, teams coming from out of the U.S., most of them, maybe right. that's something that, I don't know, the government or the state of California will have to look at on a case-by-case basis. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Yeah, it's true. Obviously, coming into the U.S. is more difficult these days because of the political stuff, but this adds another layer to that, right? Right. I assume it's going to be fine, but I we'll I would be... Again, it's kind of like you know we're saying our guess or our opinion, but in the end of the in the end we don't really fucking know anything about it, right? But You're not an oracle, Cinderin. My my gut shot is that it's going to be fine. Your I gut think. shot that is is not that the word for it? It's just your gut. My gut says. <laughs> wait, what is a gut shot again? A gut shot. Is that a th- Is that when you punch somebody oh. in the stomach? It's a. It's a it's an inside straight draw in poker. Never mind. Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh. Bringing that to I mean, we are an esports podcast, so that is technically an esport in some respect. Uh, let's talk about a couple more things outside of Dota, and then we'll finish this up. Uh, Diabotical, yep. the beta has been semi released. I believe they're doing it like a few days at a time. Uh, for those that don't know, this is the game created by Too Good. Uh, he kickstarted a long time ago. It has taken a very long time to come to fruition. It's kind of been yep. his brainchild for the better part of a decade, I believe. And if I'm not mistaken, he's refunded most people that wanted a refund from Kickstarter because it took so long. I am one of those people that did get a Kickstarter, did not want a refund because I was in, I've always like every couple months I check out the news just to see what the pr- mm-hmm. progression is and whatnot. Um, but it's a an arena based shooter with like Quake. Uh, Right, like Quake or Unreal Tournament, where your characters are like little, they're called egg bots. They're like robots, but they, they all are circles, very cuddly. You can customize them and all that good stuff. Don't think they're you've sphere, played. Shannon. Circles are 2D. <clears throat> they are circles in 3D. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cinderin, you haven't played, but what are your impressions, if any? on this game uh, before I, I get I watched mine. a very little bit of gameplay. It looks fun, honestly. Uh, I should probably try it out. Um, I Why never... You, you kickstarted it, right? No, I didn't. I didn't oh, kickstart this, what a this game. Uh, yeah, I'm an ass. So, perfect for James. Um, but, yeah, I've, I've played... I, I haven't... I'm trying to remember if I've played... I don't think I've ever played Quake or Unreal Tournament. So, like, this whole genre, I've never played. I've played shooters. I've played Call of Duty. I've played Counter-Strike, mm-hmm. CSGO. But these arena types haven't really been something I've been into. Um, so, but just looking at it, it, it looks like fun. It looks really smooth. I think in games like these, um, like these Quake-type games, I think the overall smoothness of the game plays a huge role because the yeah. gameplay of this game is precision. It's about making flashy movements. It's about hitting shots. Uh, so I think they have, I believe they've announced some really high tick servers. Um, they've announced good server infrastructure. That is what's going to carry this game is that the gameplay needs to be crisp. If it's not, it's going to die out relatively quickly because that is the game. There's like, there isn't like a campaign or a story really. It's mm-hmm. just flat out fucking go in and shoot some guys. Uh, and as far as that went, the little bit of footage I've seen for a beta looked good. I, I think it mm-hmm. looks like fun and well executed. And it really, really reminded me of Quake yeah, uh, so in an I, updated version. So that's I cool. played not as much, but I did play a good portion of my life in gaming for Unreal Tournament. Uh, Love that game. Would play a lot of Instagib. No gravity, if people know what that is. So it's very low gravity, so you jump all over the place and one shot, one kill. That's what Instagib is. They have that mode kind of in this, and that's a lot of fun. So I will say a couple things. First of all, like I talked about, this is James's baby, right? It's something he mm-hmm. believes in. He used to be a pro Quake player back in the day. Uh, yep. And that group is very close-knit, right? It's, or close-knit. Yeah. There's a lot of like fatality. I don't know if he's actually played. I should look into that. But used to be like the best player of all time. Um. From a, used to be the best player of all time. Yes, that's actually very accurate, what I just said. Sounds weird. So as yeah, of, okay. like, in like 2000, he was the best player of all time. Mm-hmm. I don't think you can say that anymore, but he was the original. Who's the best player of all time? For FPS, I couldn't tell you. No, for the genre. Player. For that genre. Yeah. Maybe it is Fatality then. 
Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Could still be. I don't know enough about it. I mean, I can't it, correct you on it. But. The risky thing about this, and they're making a game on arena FPS, is that the genre has just died down a lot, right? Yeah. And they've had, like, a lot of these companies like Quake or ID. How do you say that? ID? I say ID. ID software. I guess ID. ID software. They I came out with Quake. I forget what it was called, but it was kind of like an Overwatchy type arena-based FPS. Mm-hmm. Didn't really catch on. And it just felt like that entire genre was just not going anywhere. It was like StarCraft, but even more dead than the RTS genre. I think one thing this game can do that the other, like let's say Quake's follow-up game can't, is it has incredible networking potential. Too Good knows so many people very well. Uh, Has very good personal relations with tons of different people across many games many genres, many age groups. He's been working as talent for so many things. So when he is at the head of this game and he is the one who's able to you know, distribute keys, get people into the beta, maybe give them benefits for streaming the game or whatever, they can get incredible reach compared to what Quake's mm-hmm. follow-up game probably could because Too Good could go to, you know, even somebody like me who has never played a Quake-like game and if he was like, hey, do you want to play my game and stream it or whatever? I, I would say yes, right? Like, it would be cool to try. So Free marketing. Uh, yeah. There's there's tons of people that he could get in touch with. And mm-hmm. I'm sure he's doing it to an extent, but they might be waiting with the big strategical play until they feel like the game is ready for launch, like full on. And that might be when they go harder on it. I think it's a big right. mistake if they don't use the networking potential that they have. Like you've you've spent a lot of time on this game. You I really mean, want it to be a success. It, it's just you have. They're to giving away this. a lot of keys right now, because uh, yeah. they just want to test these servers more than anything, probably. Mm-hmm. So I want to give my impressions of the game. Right. So first and foremost, I was c- interested in it for sure, but at the same time, I was kind of done with arena FPS. So right. hopping in, it felt exactly like Unreal to me, except for maybe even. Let me talk about the things I like first. So okay. The game itself, the way that it runs, is so fucking smooth. This is a custom engine. I don't know how many years they took to make this, oh, but damn. Yeah, it runs no ridiculously well. Maybe the best running FPS game I've ever played. Um, and even though this sounds kind of like a weird thing to give props for, the control, the like the options that you have are mm-hmm. really robust. Like you can change around the UI completely, very dynamic. Uh, they made sure that to, is not like, a weird thing to give props for. A lot of games do a really bad job at that. Honestly. Everything relating to how things feel, like the sensitivity, you have so many options. And this is obviously because of Too Good's experience with FPS. He knows exactly what he wants, and he mm-hmm. knows what other people may or may not want as well. So from that perspective, unbelievable. When I played it, it's fun, but at the same time, it does feel like I'm just playing. Again, a lot of the options, a lot of the game modes are not out yet. And this is mm-hmm. just a beta, so I'm not going to give my full impressions. But it did feel like I was just playing Unreal, um, right? Which isn't a negative necessarily, like especially for you yeah. that has never played it. But I, I just feel like I that part of my say, life. What is did done, you expect? You know? uh, like, I wasn't sure. What, I was how just, did you think they were going to go above and beyond? Like, what can, within this genre, what can you do apart from make it run fantastic and make cool maps and cool? game right modes. like well what that's else part of it really that's do? part of the cool thing about this game is that there's a map editor so a lot of their maps in the future will be community made which is that's very cool. also really good that's really nice that's, but there are from my i'm perspective, hearing so many pluses right now honestly the problem okay <laughs> I, I guess what. the main negative that i have right now with the game and again this mm-hmm. is very early on the weapons specifically feel very almost precisely the same as unreal mm-hmm like they're missing it's the unreal. plasma gun. Rocket launcher is exactly the same, essentially. The rail gun is exactly the same. Um, almost all the weapons are almost exactly the same. At least that's how it feels to me. Obviously, are there might no not new exactly weapons? The there, there's like, uh, I'm sure there's something, but nothing okay. that like. Let me put it this way. Right now, this is again very early on, but from my experience, people are using like three weapons, right? Mm-hmm. You're using this link gun, this rocket launcher, or rail gun. Those are the three main ones that right. you're going to be using, and those are almost exactly the same as Unreal. Uh, the Instagib one, I do like that map uh, or that game mode because it's one shot, one kill. There's a little delay though because it's a crossbow as opposed to just a rail gun, which I was used to. Oh, that sounds like fun. But that one I had by far the most fun with. Overall, it's, it's, a, it's been a good experience and I'm looking forward to see what they add 
in the future. And obviously, the community maps can make a huge difference going forward. But I hope it revitalizes the scene. But like I said, just from an arena FPS, that's like I might play it occasionally. It will never be my main game just because I just put that behind me, I okay. guess. You know. Okay, now the big question, or I don't know if that's the big question, but we like to talk about this on this podcast. Does it have esports potential? Oh, do you think? it was built for esports, so yes. Right. I don't but, know if because that was the main goal, it, right? But... There are some games that get released that don't have esports potential, really, but are really pushing for it. Right. And then there are some games that get released that don't draw enough on the strengths that the games actually have in order to get there. Um, mm. And this is clearly something that I think too good once again with his experience with gaming, he would want that and he would try to push for it. So hopefully they get the funding and a way of making some launch tournaments that gather garner interest in it from sponsors and that he can kick off his esports cuz i think a game like this maybe more than almost any other game will really thrive from having competition when you have a game that's so essentially how to say is in its in its essence it's really basic right you're these mm -hmm. balls running around, picking up weapons, armor, and health, and you're shooting each other. The gameplay is super intuitive and extremely easy to understand. It's like very easy to follow, extremely hard to master on the highest level. Mm -hmm. Those games are super easy to watch. I have watched Quake and enjoyed myself without ever playing the game. And I feel like I watch for two minutes and I know exactly what's going on. Like the commentators just talk about strategic map control, what the weapons do, where the things are, and why the players are playing like they are. And I'm like, I get it. I understand what they're doing, right? Yep, very easy. If I watch CSGO, I also intuitively get it because I've played Counter-Strike. But if you've never played a shooter, there's like more depth. Like you Point can gun, shoot okay. person. Right. Yes. yes. But in CSGO, there's a lot more depth, which um, can both be a good and a bad thing. But in a game like this, man, you your esports scene, if it kicks off, there's going to be so many people that just... It's so easy to watch. It's the thing you just put on in the background on the couch. And, you know, it it's... It's good for digestion, is my point here. So I hope he does a good job with that. That will make a, a big impact on. Yeah, the game. I know that's a major part of their plan. So uh, yeah. hopefully it gets that's kicked good. off well. So excited to see yeah. that. All right, last topic, Cinderin. Valorant has been announced, the Riot first-person shooter, and they came out with some gameplay-related stuff. It's essentially yep. a cross between Counter Strike and Overwatch. And listen to this little blurb. Because I would love to dissect this with you. Okay. This was on their website. Here's what we think it takes for you to trust the game enough to invest. 128 tick servers, at least 30 frames per second on most min-spec computers, even dating back a decade. 60 to 144 FPS on modern gaming rigs. Rigs, A global spread of data centers aimed at less than 35 ping for players in major cities around the world. A netcode we've been obsessing over for years and a commitment to anti-cheat from day one. Shooting in Valorant is precise, consequential, and highly lethal. We want you to win on your skill and strategy alone. So I know a lot about Counter-Strike from back in the day, Sinrin, mm -hmm. as you know. This was a direct rip at Valve <laughs> because for some <laughs> stupid fucking reason, Counter-Strike Go servers are 64 tick, which is utter fucking garbage. Just garbage. Are the like core games also 64 tick? No, they play on higher rate. Of course not. Right. They would okay. complain to no end. Like, if you want to get 128 tick servers, you have to, like, as a pub, you have to play an ESEA or something. You have to get custom okay. servers going. Right. So all of this, even the anti-cheat thing, is a dig at Valve. What are your thoughts, man? Because this is very interesting in terms of shaking things up for the FPS world. You know... The reason this is funny for me is that it reminds me of... I don't know if you ever saw this ad. I'm sure a lot of our listeners or viewers remember this ad. When League of Legends was announced, they had this ad that they were running where they used the Dota acronym um, for negative associations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can find it. Oh, man. I wish I could find this right now. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Okay. I'm going to just read it out line by line. League of Legends. Why play League of Legends? No more D, disconnections. O, obnoxious <laughs> hackers. T, totally imba matches. And A, annoying levers. So they <laughs> used like the Dota acronym for all the negative things. No. This reminds me of that. Just that they're not saying, this advertisement or not, <laughs> are you tired of C for completely garbage servers? <laughs> S for, <laughs> you know... <laughs> 
uh, it's basically it's kind of similar marketing where it reminds me of you know this is advertising that is legal in the united states but is illegal in denmark where you advertise by smothering yeah yes you're you're basically throwing mud at uh, competing products right Mm -hmm. i don't know the exact ways it's legal in the u.s but i know you can advertise your car by saying this other car sucks uh whereas in denmark you need to you know it's it's not legal at least to i don't know the exact details on it but yeah i know in the u.s you advertise a lot like that it really reminds me of american advertising competitor product sucks here's what we're doing to be better than them they're not saying it directly but they're kind of kind of saying it anyway uh, so, so what opinion do you want? I mean, obviously the things they're saying here are really good if they stay true to it and do it right. Have you seen the gameplay uh, video? No, I haven't. Okay, oh, well, excellent. I saw a little bit, I think. I did see a bit. Yeah. All right, so I can give my thoughts on that. I, I watched it. Um, again, it's not like I'm going to be I covering FPS it. games or anything like that, but I thought it looked pretty cool, and it does look pretty much exactly like a cross between Overwatch and Counter-Strike in terms of which game it'll hurt more. Like, first of all, I don't think it's going to be the death of either game. Uh, mm-hmm. mainly because Overwatch is the death of itself in a lot of ways. But regardless <laughs> of my opinion on that, um, I think Counter-Strike will definitely survive because if you add any fantasy elements, it becomes more of a threat to Overwatch, in my opinion, than, right. than Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike's going to be fine. I think Overwatch not only has shot itself in the foot, which is Blizzard's kind of MO these days, but this game looks like it's just going to be a better version of it. Uh, looks pretty good. I mean, it's a bomb defusal, 5v5. Uh, which is exactly like Counter Strike, but again, I think it's going to be more of a competitor for Overwatch, personally. Intuitively, I, I've watched I, before. Now I watched a little bit of footage, and now I just watched more while we were talking about it. Just the mm-hmm. UI and the way the gameplay works. This feels so much easier to watch. It's like yes, when I watched Overwatch competitively, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Mm-hmm. And I'm watching this, and I feel like okay, I can see the individual player skill. I can see their impact. Their the way they're using things is very, there's like a very clear, how to say, there's a very clear connection between their action and the outcome, right? Right. That's something I struggle with when the, I've, hand on heart, I've never played Overwatch and I've played a very little, or watched a very little bit. So your opinion but, matters not. No, well, it does matter. But it's still a lot correct. Of, people, well, <laughs> of course it is. We don't need to say that. <laughs> I think some games when you watch, there's a very, it, it's hard to see the connection between action and outcome. Dota 2 has the same problem. If you don't know the game, you have no idea why a team won a fight. You maybe don't even know that they won a fight <laughs> after mm. it's over, right? Uh, I have that with Overwatch. I'm like, okay, I, I've watched this game for like five minutes. I have no fucking clue. I, if the commentators didn't say it, I wouldn't even know who was winning, okay? Like the UI is confusing, the layout, the way characters use their spells or, sh- or the weapons or whatever, ultimates, whatever they're called. Can't really tell. I watched this gameplay. I'm like, okay, you know. Guy shoots guy. There's a kill icon coming up. You throw some sort of grenade that makes smoke or whirlwind or whatever the shit is. You have like mm-hmm. some plasma spell that makes a wall. It's like very... I like that in the design of this that I can tell something happens and this is what it does. Um, so that for me is a big plus, which Dota as a game just can't do, I think. I actually think Dota is doing a really good job. It could have been way worse. We were talking off uh, before this podcast today. I was watching a Han clip and I was like... I. I feel like Han's design with colors and with spells it's was even less even less intuitive when you watched it. I, I had I would have less idea what was going on. I mean, that's that one of those things that but, kind of evolved over time to be worse, just because they had to mm-hmm. add tons of cosmetics. Right. Uh, but see, so yeah, I can't say in vanilla Han how it was. Maybe it was so great. I don't from know, my perspective, Valorant is looks... a very interesting game, though. Not only is it a new genre for Riot and whatnot, uh, on top of their card game now, and obviously League. But mm. it sounds like what they are prioritizing the most is making sure that the the aim and skill of you is what's going to be the biggest difference in the outcome of the yes. actual match. So yeah. I think from an Overwatch perspective, obviously you're going to have some skills similar to Overwatch, but they're going to have less impact than Overwatch. Um, it's going to be more Counter-Strike in that It's more regard. about the shots than the spells. Yes. Is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. And I'm not... I saw like some of the effects they had, they're very cartoonish. Like it's mm-hmm. weird because the gameplay itself looks like Counter Strike, very similar. But then any yeah. effect that you see is very cartoonish, which I'm not a fan of. But can, it's not like it's not going to make the game fun necessarily. It just depends on uh, what you prioritize. From it's a also a bit about you need, you need to know your audience, right? Um, Fortnite, as an example, um, 
obviously extremely cartoonish in colors, in design, in everything. It's very in that direction, very uncounter strikey. Great success, especially within an age group of 13 to 18 year olds. So, um, you know, those players will probably be drawn to this game. That's also a huge part of League's active player segment, right? Is younger players. I, I don't think this, this to a much smaller degree appeals to Dota's uh, player segment, which is on average older, on average more tied to Counter-Strike because that was the other game they grew up with. Mm-hmm. When I watch this gameplay, I don't feel drawn to it. I'm not like, hell yeah, I need to try out this game. Uh, if my friends are playing it, I might try it because it looks like it's fun. It doesn't look like a bad game. It looks like it could be fun to play with friends. Um, but I'll I don't have the same connection with this as other people that, for example, play Riot games, play League of Legends or play their card game or that mm-hmm. actively play Fortnite or uh, Overwatch, where I agree with you 100%. The majority of the players they're going to win over would be from those games, I think. So. Yep. But so, yeah, I, for for a first reveal, it's it's not bad. We were like wondering how good are these new titles from Riot going to be. This is a good first showing, I think. I'm not sure it's, if it's I can't, I should have maybe researched this a bit more, but I'm not sure if it's free to play or not. I not sure if oh, that's I even no been announced. Either. I don't know. Uh, I should mention yeah, they might, Diabolical yeah. is free to play. Uh, I think the only and thing then the customization is what it costs, right? Yeah, yeah. And then for Valorant, not sure, but it will be coming out. Some it says summer of 2020. I've heard that the beta will actually be released in the coming couple weeks, so very soon, oh. potentially, like this well, month. Then we could try it and talk about it. Yes, we month. absolutely will do that. So you I will am, do that. Awesome. I am definitely. We can play together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. U.S. East. You uh, you like and it. someone else can play together. Okay, sounds good. I'll just name them Cinderin, <laughs> and we'll just pretend it's you. <laughs> make <laughs> make sure he make sure he's like super racist, and then just put your name on it, right? No yeah, problem. That sounds like me. That's me. <laughs> All right. Well, that is the end of we say things for this week. Have Episode you seen forty three? I know it's insane, and most of those are unsponsored. Cinderin, is that even more yeah. surprising? E- I'm doing a great job of <laughs> negotiating for sure. Yeah, I think so. Uh, have you seen in Bruges? Just get it over with. No. Okay, thank you. You know, I would really appreciate it if by episode 52, which is the full year mark, even though we've skipped, you know, a little mm-hmm. bit of time, that you watch it by 52. That should be my reward. Hmm. Just think about that, all right? Just think about how much you will disappoint me. I will, like right now, it doesn't feel like anything. I'm already expecting what to What if say I no. told you that I watched Joker? Did you watch Joker? No, but what if I told you? <laughs> I mean, we could talk about it, but uh, it wouldn't be as exciting as in Bruges. Okay. Thanks, Cinder. By the way, thank you to everybody okay. that's tweeting at us uh, that are visiting Bruges itself, the city, and sending it's us pictures. It's been actually really fun to see. <laughs> it's a really cool looking city. I'm not going to lie. I'd love to visit sometime. Uh, it's like a picture. I think there was a picture on the Europe subreddit or something with a picture of Bruges, <laughs> and I got tagged in it. It's like, this is fun, you know. Somebody just tagged me in that place. Yeah, you'll forever be Hilarious. connected with Bruges. So congratulations yeah. to you, Cinder. All right, guys. Imagine thanks if for I watching. just watched it the first week. It wouldn't have been interesting then. That's look uh, at how far there, it's come. There is a buildup. I agree, but you've taken it to the extreme, as you do everything. I like doing that with things. I know. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, until next time, Suns fans. Cinder and signing out. Goodbye. Peace. We say things that don't mean anything, but thanks for listening. Yeah.